If you look up what are the best shots in movie history, you'll find one list after another of nothing but beautiful shots and, yes, long and complex tracking shots. Though these are all nice and dandy, nothing but visual beauty can feel rather superficial. What makes a good shot is not just a beautiful composition and impressive cinematography, it's whether that shot is the best possible way to state whatever it wants to state. If character A arrives, there is an infinite amount of ways to show character A arriving. One of them may be brilliant, I don't know, this example is too vague. Talking about vagueness, you know what's awesome smart? When a shot shows you what you don't see. Encapsulate the spirit of melancholy. Easy. Boom, a sad desk. Boom, sad wall. It's art. Anything is anything. How is that even possible, I hear you ask? Shots show, that's why they're called shots. Actually, no, I don't know who or what gave you that idea, but to properly talk about a shot's capacity to show absence, let's talk about the greatest film director of all time, Billy Wilder. Keep him in mind, he'll come up again in a short while. Billy Wilder had a sign on his office which said, how would Lubitsch do it? And who is Lubitsch and why didn't I lead off with him, I hear you ask? Ernst Lubitsch was Wilder's idol and creator of what is now called the Lubitsch Touch. But what is the Lubitsch Touch, I hear you ask? Inquisitive today, aren't we? The Lubitsch Touch is to cinema what the word metaphysics is to drunken midnight conversations, as in, you hear it, inquire about it, get a confounding reply and smile and nod in ignorance, pretending you understood it. Then you google it and remain as confused as you were in the beginning, having as little idea what it means as you have of how this long winding sentence even started. Full stop. But lucky for you, Mr. Movie Wise is here to clarify. The Lubitsch touch, I mean. I still don't really get what metaphysics are all about. The Lubitsch touch is the art of implying instead of showing, both in the writing and in the directing. That is all. Anyone says otherwise is trying to sell you a book. Let's talk about Lubitsch's 1937 film Angel, which I totally watched more than once, including just now, so I could properly talk about it instead of relying on my hazy memory, like a professional YouTuber would do. Our male lead meets our female lead, never mind their names, I know I don't. He takes her out for a fancy dinner like the dapper gent he is, and they are serenaded by this obnoxiously invasive violinist. The theme he just improvised becomes their music. How sweet! It later turns out our female lead is married. She is married to female lead's husband. She plays him the violin tune on the piano and tells him she just made it up. There were no copyright strikes in them days. Female lead's cuckold husband later suspects she cheated on him and he calls our male lead. The butler leaves the phone as he goes call male lead who very inconveniently for all involved, is playing that same tune on the piano. Lubitsch simply lingers the camera on the phone, because he knows we are like the cuckold. That is, smart enough to connect the dots and conclude he now knows his wife has two-timed him. And know that with a simple close-up of a phone handset. Brilliant! But that's not the most brilliant shot in film history. We're just exemplifying the Lubitsch touch to get there. Another amazingly brilliant shot is in the epic western Giant, by criminally underrated genius George Stevens. It's called Giant because it's about Texas, which is big. So good thing it's not set in Rhode Island, I guess? Mercedes McCambridge rides a horse, but gets a little too spur-happy. I guess it was the spur of the moment. 
The next time we see the horse, it's in this brilliant shot. I call it brilliant because you can tell exactly what happened by just looking. Notice how all the weight is concentrated on the left of the frame. The dark looming house accentuates how empty is the light right of the frame. It gives the impression that something is missing. The horse is settled, so even someone who hasn't seen anything that came before in the film can conclude that the missing thing is the rider. If a rider is missing, an accident must have happened. Therefore, this shot from George Stevens' Giant is the second most brilliant shot in movie history. No, this is not the most brilliant shot I'm here to talk about. It just looks better as a thumbnail than a door in black and white. Spoiler alert for the video you're watching. Remember Billy Wilder, the greatest director of all time? Of course you do, you all observing attractive content enjoyer. Billy Wilder's absolute masterpiece, Sunset Boulevard, is the film with the most brilliant shot in movie history. It follows Joe, a down-and-out screenwriter who can't sell a script. He is considering giving up and becoming a YouTuber. I mean, going back to his town to work in an office. I mixed him up with um, a, a friend of mine. Then he meets Norma Desmond, a forgotten aging movie star from the silent era, and she is only 50. Times used to be tough. Norma Desmond is a delusional and insane narcissist who considers herself the greatest star of all time. I am big. It's the picture that got small. She hires Joe to write a screenplay to be her comeback. I didn't know you were planning a comeback. I hate that word. It's a return. What's the difference? Isn't a comeback a return? Let me check a thesaurus. Yes, it is. What a petty semantic complaint. She must be a humanities major. When were you born? I mean, what sign of the zodiac? Yep, she's a humanities major. You can add that to her list of deviances. Sagittarius. I like Sagittarians, you can trust them. Thank you. Joe moves to her house and inquires Norma's butler and ex-husband. It's a queer dynamic. Why there are no doorknobs in the house. The doctor suggested it. What doctor? Madame's doctor. Madame has moments of melancholy. There have been some attempts at suicide. Keep that in mind. Later, in Norma Desmond's New Year party, Joe finds out that there are no other guests and this woman who made him move to her house and bought him a new wardrobe and gifts wants to get in his pants. Not a very observant writer, are you, Joe? He says he's not really into older women who are crazy and will definitely murder him by the end of the movie, though not in those words, and she storms off. Did you notice that? Tell me right now what will happen next. You know you got it. The door closes and the camera approaches just slightly the doorknob. Wait, there are no doorknobs because they had them removed so she wouldn't kill herself. Oh my god, she'll kill herself. That. There. That's the most brilliant shot in movie history because with nothing but a slight camera movement and some minimally dramatic lighting, we are told in bold letters that a character will try to kill herself. And we get that by seeing what is basically nothing. Just like we get the cuckold's realization with the telephone in Angel. Just like we get the idea of an accident with the empty space in Giant. Isn't absence incredible? Billy Wilder even plays with the missing doorknob again in Sunset Boulevard. Joe and Norma have a little discussion later in the film, and she goes to her room. The camera approaches the holes. That's what she said. As the music swells. Will she try it again? Nope. She just went to bed. Billy is the GOAT. He came close to this level of brilliancy in The Lost Weekend about alcoholic Don Burnham. Don goes out for only one drink, as have we all, 
And to show how well he kept that I'll promise, Billy Thomas fades to this shot. Okay, I only brought this up to show you how it seems Billy Wilder never drank in his life. And I don't mean just booze, anything, not even a glass of water. Everybody knows that every time you sip, you place the glass in another spot on the table, so as far as I know, all these water rings came from the same glass. Only someone suffering from extreme OCD would place the glass exactly on the same spot every time. So, as far as I know, Don only had one drink. Therefore, your honor, he is not an alcoholic. And neither am I. Oh, damn, he's not sipping at all. Your honor, I demand a mistrial. Moving on. I know I already talked about the most brilliant shot in movie history, but I know you want more examples. Yeah, I do. Excellent, because I have a perfect one. But be warned, I am about to show you some of the most explicit sexual shots ever filmed. Here we go. Why are you doing this? Why am I doing this? Whoops, sorry, sorry, almost showed Sofia Coppola single-handedly gang-banging the entire Godfather franchise. No, I'll show something way cleaner. Dad? Though still dirty. In Stanley Donen's The Grass is Greener, bored, filthy, rich housewife Deborah Kerr meets Robert Mitchum. They pretend they won't have an extramarital affair and will only go on perfectly platonic, non-date dates. And we get this sequence of shots. There's the absence I've been talking about. They didn't go canoeing. They didn't have a picnic. They didn't have dinner or watch a concert. Where are they? What are they doing? Oh, right. Stop it. Get some help. These are all events in the same day. So, if you think about it, every new shot is like a new position. This is why these are among the dirtiest shots ever shown in mainstream cinema. Moving on. In the golden age of Hollywood, there was a production code regulating what films could show, so they had to be discreet. Nowadays, you can just shoot your double <laughs> depressed <laughs> heart <laughs> khaki orgy scene as much as you want, but in the good old days, directors had to get creative to imply their double head <laughs> to a heart <laughs> scenes because they were gentlemen think of what those shots i showed you are implying adultery alcoholism suicide f***ing and death they are all cases of creative directors circumventing the production code and having your filthy mind fill in the blanks speaking of your filthy mind remember the ending of alfred hitchcock's north by northwest the movie that influenced every james bond film it's going to be a long night. True. And I don't particularly like the book I've started. Ah. You know what I mean? Ah, let me think. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. It ends like this. How is it possible the censors let that slide? Or have our brains just been ruined by great directors? I don't know what you and the censors think they're doing on that bed, but I take the position that they're playing Pacheesi. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share it. And what do you think is the most brilliant shot in movie history? Leave a comment. I will see you next time and this is Movie Wise.